Good morning and welcome to Printing Gospel Chapel online service. Today is the day that we call Remembrance Day and it's a day when we endeavour to bring to the forefront in our minds the fact that many people in two world wars and wars after that gave their lives that we can have freedom, freedom to move around. And although we don't have the freedom that we used to in so many ways, we still have that freedom. We have the freedom to worship God. We have the freedom to be together when we can. Um, and we pray that that freedom will be fully restored as soon as possible. So in remembrance of those people who gave their lives, we're going to have just a few moments silence. Father, it is with thanks that we remember those who gave their lives, that we can be free. Amen. This morning we're going to have time of sung worship. We're going to have a time together around the communion table. We're going to bring our prayers to our Father in heaven and we're going to meditate on God's word. So we pray that all of us who take part, that everyone will see something new uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ today.
come to a time of prayer now um, and we obviously want to remember as it's Remembrance Sunday today uh, and also it kind of seems quite significant as I'm recording this as we've just gone into our second season of lockdown so it's sort of somewhat burdensome but um, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, although things may be tough around us, Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege, Father, that we can just come and we can just talk to you, our Father. Today, Father, on Remembrance Sunday, we do want to give you our real, genuine, heartfelt thanks, Lord, for all of those brave men and women throughout the years, from the Great War, from the other wars, and more recently, um, the conflict that we've seen in our world, Father. But we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for their bravery and the way that they defended and stood up for, you know, freedom for us, Lord, that we can live today in the way that we, well, we have been up until now. And Father, today it kind of seems very, very heavy in our hearts, Lord, that perhaps our freedom has once again been curtailed. And Lord, our front line today is very much the brave men and women, our doctors, our nurses, our scientists, our paramedics, those who are really on our front line today, still working to kind of keep us safe um, during these tough times. Father, we just cry out to you, Lord, in the way that we can. And Lord, just ask for a special blessing, Father, your protection, your energising to fall upon those people who are working tirelessly, Lord, to look after us at this time. Father, we do pray for those who are who are sick at this time, Lord, whether with the COVID virus, Father, or just whether with other conditions, Lord. And again, we just pray for them, Lord, that you would just draw close to them, Lord. Give them your peace. Give them your comfort, your love and your encouragement, Lord, at this time. Father, we do think of those who are, are really struggling emotionally at this time, Lord. And I'm just so encouraged that the last couple of days have been such beautiful weather, Lord. It's been such a, a blessing to be able to kind of breathe in that fresh air, to see that sunshine in the sky, Lord, and, and it lifts our spirits. But Father, I do pray for those who are, who are perhaps unable to get outside, Lord. Those who are sort of maybe stuck in their houses and, and maybe feeling that sort of real sense of being trapped at this time, Lord. But I pray, Father, especially for them, that they too would be encouraged to look, really look through their windows, maybe open their windows and still breathe in a little of that fresh air, to listen for the bird song in the garden, to maybe see the, the trees and the little plants blowing around, Lord, and, and just still be so encouraged, Father, by all of your nature and your creation that you've just left there for us to enjoy. And I especially pray, Father, of a blessing that could be at a time like today. On, um, on social media, I've seen a post this week and it said, we isolate now so that when we gather again today, no one is missing. And Father, that just really resonated with me and I just thought we just need to really take that to our hearts, Lord. And however hard and however tough it may be, Father, I just pray that we will, maybe somewhat reluctantly, maybe with those heavy hearts, Father, but I pray that we especially will, will be prepared to, to follow the guidance, to follow the rules and play our part so that nobody, Lord, will be missing when we can reopen and we can meet again. Father, we pray for each other. We just think of our, our chapel family, Lord, and our kind of extended chapel family, those of you that are joining with us during this time on law, online. And Lord, I just pray a blessing over you all. I pray that you will be safe during these tough times. I pray that, you know, you will just feel a little of that special touch from our, our wonderful Lord to keep you encouraged, to keep your spirits lifted, to keep you motivated at this time. Father, it may seem that we're helpless and we can do nothing other than pray. But, you know, I just want to encourage us all, Lord, that actually that should be the first and the most foremost things in our mind. Many people are looking for answers in our scientists, our doctors, our government, when actually, Lord, putting it simply, Father, 
I think you have all the answers. I mean, thank you, Lord, that you are in control. And again, at this time, that wonderful verse in 2 Chronicles 7, uh, 14 and 15, where it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. And Father, I just pray that prayer now over our nation. And I pray that's something that us as Christians, Lord, will will want to do. We can do it every day, whether we're indoors, whether we're out and about. But I just really feel it's, I have a bit of a burden in my heart, I think. But I really feel it's so, so, so timely for today. And um, yeah, just, just encourage us, Lords, as Christians, to want to pray, to seek your face at this time, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that you will, you will reward us in only the way that you can, Lord. And that will be in your way, not that the way that we dare to ask for or hope for even, Lord. It will be the way that you choose to bless us through this, tri- this crisis. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can still come together. We thank you that we can can still pray. We can still reach out to you wherever we may be. And Father, I pray that you will encourage us to do that from day to day. In your name we pray. Amen. Hello, all. Welcome to our Remembrance Sunday Communion. So let's start uh, with a prayer. Lord, we are saddened at the thought of war, of the soldiers who must fight, and all those people who are killed. Today we remember their sacrifice with great sadness, and we thank them for what they did for us. We also remember that they won for us a victory, that without their bravery these wars may have been lost, and our lives could have been so very different without the freedom that we so much enjoy. We thank them for what they did for us. We are saddened at the thought of your suffering, Lord, that you too had to be a great hero and to walk to Jerusalem, be arrested, tried and killed on that terrible cross. We thank you for what you did for us. We also remember that you won for us a victory, that on Easter morning you rose again and helped us to overcome our human nature, so that we might rise again with you. We thank you for what you did for us. Amen. Just a few scriptures before we break bread and drink the wine. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And so as we come to the bread, we say the Lord Jesus On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
History can inspire or trap. Walls can protect or divide. Words can encourage or inflame. Power can free or destroy. Touch can comfort or violate. Peace can be shared or withheld. Gracious God, on this day when we remember past and present conflicts, we pray for the divided peoples of the world, that leaders, governments and each one of us may use our resources, our opportunities and our lives in the service of reconciliation for the sake of future generations and to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi kids, today we're going to learn about a word, perseverance. It means to keep going even when times get tough. And if we believe in God and we follow him, we know that we can persevere with God. He is with us even in the times when we struggle. It's a bit like when you go to the cupboard and you get your favourite jar or something you really want to eat and you can't open the jar. I love jam and I love it on my toast in the morning, but I couldn't open this jar the other day. I had to persevere to get it open because I really wanted to eat some. So I've done it up really tight and I'm gonna try to open it so I can have some yummy jam on toast. So after seeing how um, difficult it was for me to open that jam jar and how I persevered and got there in the end, we can see a really amazing story in the Bible, um, a guy called Joseph who persevered and really trusted in God. Now some of you may remember him with his colourful coat that his father gave him. He was the favoured son. His dad loved him the most out of all the sons, which for the others was a bit tricky. They got really jealous of Joseph. And if you remember, they took him away and um, sold him. First of all, they put him in a well and then they sold him um, to some travellers that were coming past, some tradesmen. And they went back and they told the dad that he had died. So it was a really awful, awful thing they did. But Joseph, he trusted in God. He went to prison. He got in trouble, but he kept trusting in God. And then God brought him to the king and he ended up leading Egypt. He was an Egyptian leader. So he got there in the end. And I just want to read you the story of Joseph, the one who was sold by his family, by his brothers, ended up saving his family. So let's read the story. Joseph saves his family. For the first seven years, Joseph was in charge of gathering extra food for the people of Egypt. That way, when hardly any crops grew, there would still be plenty to eat. Then the seven bad years began and people in other countries had no food at all. Even Joseph's family did not have enough to eat. So Joseph's father sent his sons to Egypt to buy some food. When the brothers arrived in Egypt, they went to Joseph and bowed down to him. They did not know he was their brother, but Joseph knew. Joseph sold them some food. Then the brothers left to go home. Sometime later, they returned to buy more food. Just as Joseph had dreamed, they bowed down to him again. Finally, Joseph told them, I am your brother. His brothers were afraid. But Joseph told them, do not be afraid. God meant it for good. He had a special plan for me, he said, and they all hugged. Joseph's brothers rushed home. They told their father what had happened. 
Jacob was so happy to hear that Joseph was alive. The whole family moved to Egypt. So this family came back together because Joseph persevered, got through the tough times with God's help, and he got there in the end to be with his family again, and he forgave them, and they were all happy together. So we hope you've learned something from this story, that even when times are a little bit tough, you can persevere with God. He will help you and he will give you the strength. Have a great week, kids. Bye. Luke 15, 11 to 24. The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Hi everyone, my name's Ian and thank you for the privilege of bringing a message from the Bible to you this morning. Your Bible series at the moment is asking the question, what is God like? And this morning, to help us answer that question, we're going to look at probably the greatest short story ever told. The story has one simple message. God is love. So to set the scene behind me right now, you can see one of my favourite pictures. It's one of Ben's paintings, and it's called Unconditional. And we're going to look at the story of the prodigal son. And however well we think we know this amazing story, I believe that God wants to speak to every single one of us through it. And actually, it's a tale of two parties, and it begins with party one. Party one, you can see in verse 11 of our reading, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And that's party one. You see, this son... This younger son, he wants to party. It's obvious he wants to party. And he doesn't want to party at home. He wants to go out to party. And he doesn't want to be around his father. And he doesn't want to be around his older brother. And when you hear about his older brother later, you can see why. And so he wants to go off. He wants to party without rules, without any restrictions. Now, obviously, this is a Bible talk. And there's no prizes for guessing that Jesus isn't really just talking about family relationships here. He's talking about our relationship with God. And what he's talking about is 
running away from God. Jesus is talking about all of us. And maybe we run away from God in a very wild and noticeable way, or maybe we run away from God in a very quiet way. We just busily get on with our lives and God just gets shelved. Jesus isn't just talking about this one son here. He's talking about all of us. So anyway, the younger son goes off to party one and it's life without the father. It's life without God. But the party doesn't work. Jesus doesn't tell us much about what the party's like, except that it's wild, wild living. It lasts for a time and then it stops. He runs out of resources. The beer runs dry, basically. He runs out of finances. There's hard times of famine that come. And there's something else as well. It's not just that the fun runs out. Really, this party number one that he goes to, it's really quite exclusive. It's a party for those who have, if you like, if you've got the resources, in his case, the money, because he got it off his dad. And as long as you've got the money, the party goes on. But when the money runs out, he finds himself in big difficulty. And there's a big truth about God here. It was expressed to me by a friend some years ago, and he said to me this. He said, Ian, your life won't make sense when you're far from God. And I remember that. And the more I think about it, and the more I've lived, the more I realise he's absolutely right. Your life doesn't make sense when you're far from God. And that's really what this younger son is a picture of. Jesus is painting a picture of a life running away from God and it just falls apart. And in verse 17 that we read, that's why it says when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, this guy realizes, he says, do you know, I don't want this. It wasn't what I was hoping for. This is not what I was intending when I set off for party number one, that I'd end up feeding pigs and desperate to fill my own stomach with what the pigs were eating. That's not what I was thinking of. It's time to go home. So that's it for party one. And you know, and I know, that there's a second party. But the thing is, there's an immense problem because you can't just go from party one to party two. It's difficult. And not just because of the geography, not just because you've got to get from A to B. There's a huge problem. And the problem is this. This son, this younger son has offended absolutely everybody on the guest list for party two. That's the problem. He's offended his father. He's insulted his brother and his family. He's actually upset the whole village. And that is a big problem. It's a particularly big problem in the traditional culture that Jesus was talking in. Because in that Palestinian culture, you had the head of the house, an honourable figure in the village. And the thing you can never do, you can never shame the head of the family. And that's really important if we're going to understand what Jesus is driving at here. Because Jesus tells a story where there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of disrespect. And the first time it happens, we read at the beginning, it's when the son says to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate, which you may already know is basically saying, Father, let's imagine you're dead and I can have your money. So give me your money. That's what he's doing here. Now, that's even rude in our culture, isn't it? You say, Grandad, what a lovely antique cabinet you have. And by the way, how's your health? It's not appropriate. It's rude. And anyway, the father splits up the inheritance. He takes his portion and he goes off and he wastes it. And this is shameful. He's done something highly shameful to his father. And it's not just the father, it's to the whole village. The whole village has been shamed by this. 
Let me read to you something from Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. Chapter 21 of Deuteronomy says this. If someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline him, they shall say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town are to stone him to death. That's the law. That's how much it matters if you bring shame on family and if you're absolutely rebellious. So there's this big problem in coming out of party one and trying to get anywhere near party two. And the son knows this. He knows as he's walking home, there's this great cloud of shame over him. And at this point, as he's returning, nobody knows what's going to happen. But interestingly, everybody has an expectation about what will happen. Uh, We know what his older brother expects. The older brother expects that his father will disown him. He's expecting him to be cut off from the family. We know what the villagers expect because of that reading from Deuteronomy. We know that they expect some kind of punishment. And we actually know what the younger son was expecting because we see him rehearsing his apology on the way home. He's thinking, I tell you what, again, in verse 19, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's expecting that it's impossible to go back to the way things were. So those were the expectations that he'll be cut off, that he'll be punished or that he'll just get the bare minimum. And what Jesus does is he tells a story which just blows all that away. It just blows it away. It's just so much beyond what would be expected. It's absolutely amazing. See, the craziest thing that happens is that the father, what I love about the father is that he doesn't wait for these expectations to have a chance to materialize. He doesn't even give it a chance before the brother has a chance to disown him. The father's running down the road to meet him because he's been scouring the horizon for his lost son. So the brother never has a chance to disown him, which is probably one of the reasons why he's so cross. And before the villagers have a chance to execute some kind of rough justice, they haven't got a chance either because the father's already there. He's run out. He's thrown his arms around him and he starts kissing him and that makes punishment difficult. And even the son, he doesn't have a chance to get what he's expecting because he's halfway through his thing. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And his father cuts him off. You hear more of the speech as he's rehearsing it on the way home than you do when he meets the father because you can't get the words out. And the father's like, no, 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 no. Get sandals for his feet. Get a robe for his back. Get a ring for his finger. Kill the fattened calf. The whole village is having a feast because my son's home. So the father, he's on it. And by taking the initiative, he deals with the problem before anybody else gets a chance. And he does it in particular by taking the shame and the cost on himself. We said that when the son was walking home, there's this great cloud of shame, this immense cloud of shame. And Jesus has deliberately told a story where somebody has every kind of shame on them. He's got family shame because he's broken relationship with his father and his brother and everybody else. He's got moral shame because he's been up to who knows what in the far country. I mean, his brother has it to guess. He's got religious shame because he's found himself doing something that's religiously unclean. For a Jew to look after pigs which are unclean is filthy and it's disrespectful. So the son walks home with this great cloud of shame. But the father's response is to run. 
is to run towards him and just embrace him. And when he does that, the shame actually goes on to the father. You see, it was shameful for a Middle Eastern man in those days to hitch up his robes and run in public. It's shameful. So what happens is the kid is coming home and the shame is on the kid. But as soon as the father starts running, it's him who attracts the attention. And the shame goes on him. He disrespects himself by just saying, I forgive you. And by welcoming his son home so lavishly. All the shame and the attention goes on the father. And it's off the sun. And the villagers, even if they wanted to execute the punishment that the law requires, they can't do it. How do you throw stones at someone who's being embraced by an innocent man? As long as the father has him in his arms, they can't do a thing. And so the father has humiliated himself, but saved his child. And we know that this is a story that Jesus told, but it's actually a story about real life. Real truths about our relationship with God, and that's really important. It's a story, if you like, but it's not fiction, because one of the other things we know from history about Jesus, we know historically that he died on a Roman cross. He was tortured. He was given a death that was so unspeakable that a Roman citizen would not be allowed to be crucified. It was too horrendous. It was too shameful. But if you read the Gospels at all, well, I'm convinced he's an innocent man. So what is an innocent man doing, suffering such a vile and shameful death? Jesus actually tells us much more clearly In Mark's Gospel in chapter 10, he says, The Son of Man came not to be saved, but to save and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus is explaining, I'm going to suffer, but you are going to go free. I pay the ransom. You go free. All the shame, any kind of shame you can imagine and any of the punishment that goes with it that rests on you and me. When Jesus died on the cross, it went on him and we go free. He paid the cost so that we could be embraced by God as if we'd never left home in the first place. So if you're wondering What is God like? Or if you want to ever come back to God, what's the welcome going to be like? Jesus is saying it's going to be like this. You've got to know, you've got to know that if you turn your back on God, whether you've been following him for decades or whether you've never given your life to him at all, you've got to know that the moment you turn back, what am I going to get? Jesus says this, is what you're going to get. This is the welcome you're going to have. And if that's not part of your picture of God, then you've got the wrong God. This is the God of love that Jesus is talking about. Okay, so we need to wrap this up. So we've had party one, we've had the problem and how God has dealt with the problem. And so that brings us to party two. And what a party it is. A fattened calf in those days would feed an entire village. I mean, this is the stuff of weddings. So in this banquet, it's not like the first party because there's enough for everyone. And it's not like the first party because everyone is invited. And we sometimes think about coming back to God and you think, do you know, I've messed things up. There are broken relationships at church, it's going to be difficult, or do you know, I'd love to come back to God, but you don't know the things I've done. And what Jesus is saying in this story is that all that is gone. All those kinds of shame that would keep you from coming back to God 
all that's gone. Don't let anybody keep you from coming back to God. God is love. God is a father running down the road to meet you and his heart is filled with compassion. And if God throws his arms around you and makes you his child, then no one can accuse you of anything. So that's it. What is God about? God is love. What is God's plan? God's plan is a banquet. God's business is a party. And Jesus calls it the kingdom of God. And right now, that's what God does. He invites you to dinner. He's already paid the cost. There's a chair for you at the top table. And God says, come. The banquet is ready. Come home. All the shame has been dealt with so that all that's left is joy. So come home. God, who loves you unconditionally, is having a banquet, a party. And we are all invited. Amen.
never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Thank you for being with us this morning. We do pray and trust that God has spoken to you, that you have seen the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that you will be refreshed and renewed and ready to face this coming week, whatever it may bring, whatever the difficulties, whatever the trials, whatever it may be, we pray. Just trust that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ will be with each one of us. Amen. Amen.